dystopian times. So I know currently right now you're wondering who's going to be the next progressive champion to run for president. Well, folks, fear not, because QAnon Congresswoman to appear at key <laughs> Iowa event, sparking speculation of a White House run. I think I found my 2024 candidate, folks. QAnon believing Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene may be gearing up for a run at the White House. Bloomberg News' Jennifer Jacobs reports that Greene is scheduled to appear later this month at the Iowa State Fair, which she notes is a traditional venue for politicians contemplating presidential campaigns. Jacobs adds that it's not yet clear whether Marjorie Taylor Greene will speak at Iowa State Fair or just attend it, and she notes that the Des Moines Register this year isn't organizing a soapbox, which politicians in the past have used to raise their profiles for a national campaign. Green so far has served less than one term in the United States House of Representatives, where she has been removed from her committee assignments over her past calls to have House Speaker Nancy Pelosi executed, <laughs> among other reasons. Oh, so, okay. I mean, long story short, she very likely will run for president. So this is the question that I want to ask the panel. Viable or not, I have my answer, but he... Can she win in the United States of America? No shot. No shot. No shot. No shot. Maybe like she could run, cause a stir, and then like future, like open the path for other QAnoners in the future. You know, she could be the QAnon trailblazer. But uh, I don't think it's similar how to how Bernie Sanders got so close, but never actually became the progressive champion we wanted. Uh, this, uh, yeah, I don't think she has a chance, but someone in my chat did say, hell yeah, margin charge. And I feel like if <laughs> that would be her slogan when she runs for sure. margin charge, no, stop it, Sarah, in the United States of America, I, I, I honestly feel like your answer to this question is a gauge of the amount of trust you have in like your fellow Americans. Is she viable? Yes or no? <laughs> no. Sorry, I'm not very like hiding my feelings. That's one thing that I like stopped having to do after a campaign. Let it rip. So, yeah. Like, now I'm like, um, if you had asked me in like three years ago, I would have been like, no. But let me tell you something. Not taking, I have like two key points on this. Like, not taking Nutter Butters seriously wound us up with um, Donald DJ Trumpo um, for four freaking years because no one took him seriously. We're lazy about campaigning. Hillary was lazy about campaigning. Everyone was like, oh, it's just Donald Trump. No way in hell. And that didn't go over very well. So, do I think she has a chance? Um, I don't think she doesn't have a chance. But the other thing that like to keep in mind, and this is so cool, if you've never read like, I'm just gonna plug a book I'm reading. So like, I'm sorry, oh, yeah. this is, like not allowed. Um, so I'm reading Culture Warlords by Talia Lavin. If you have not read it, it is such beautiful insight on like anti-Semitism and white supremacy and in, in like the underbelly of these circles and like what it looks like in white supremacist circles. Like part of the reason Donald Trump was able to, to say all these horrible things and be this horrible goblin um, and he was able to like bridge strolls away to the White House is because he was a white man saying it. But mm -hmm. white supremacy and misogyny go really, really closely hand in hand. And so having a woman try and say the same crass things violates this like um, white supremacist um, idealized perfect woman narrative in their heads. So she can't get away with saying the same things and capture that same vote that got him elected. So I do, I think she's unviable in the sense that to capture those white supremacist crowds, she as a woman can't come out and just espouse all these things. Like, and she's not like, she doesn't, um, she's trying to say what they consider masculine things as a woman. Like they're not gonna, that's not gonna fly in those crowds. And they're the reason Donald Trump was elected. So I don't think she'll be able to capture the base she would need. So I don't think so, but I also think it would be lazy and stupid to not at least pretend take to her take serious. it seriously. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, don't don't downplay the threat. Um, yeah. I, I just watched the first episode of the Humanist Report on the last Twitch stream. And in that first episode, I covered Donald Trump's campaign launch. And, you know, I, I, I asked myself this question. Does Donald Trump have a chance? Should we, we be worried? And my answer, no, not at all. He doesn't have it. Mm -hmm. So now <laughs> I've learned that. Everybody did it. Myself I've did learned it. that lesson. Yeah, Donald yeah, Trump I definitely... has a chance the second time? I do. No, I don't. I don't, I don't, think don't so. actually. I, do. I don't think he does. He, I do. Um, 
You do. So the only reason that I say that is because like I, um, my partner's parents are like deeply, deeply deep homes. He was homeschooled all the way up through the church conservative. Mm. Um, he became a dirty, disgusting, super left socialist. So he's fine. But um, both their kids are now totally socialist. It's so wild. But That's so he awesome. grew up in that community. I use them as a gauge for like what's going on because they're so in the rabbit hole. Um, the amount of betrayal people feel in that community by Donald Trump, like we don't see it because we're not in those communities communities like they feel the same level of betrayal that some of these very online turbo leftists feel about AOC hmm. um if for some reason she wasn't able to change the tides of hundreds and hundreds of year old she's not the queen system. of America after three years she can't change a 250 year old system that's been marginally oppressing people like her forever get her out of there um and designed to be incremental <laughs> exactly right, and like right. so that's a lot why of people, like, I think don't they, realize that but so they don't but like they think it's like, why, like uh, why can't we just get everything done it's like the, the the system's literally the same reason that donald trump wasn't able to undo everything that's half decent in america is the same reason why progressives struggle to get progressive policies it's literally exactly. meant to be incremental and slow it at the institutional like level like, like that's 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 one thing i really think is an important point institutionally speaking by design like this is all like <laughs> rapid change in the united states is very, very rare. And that's why we look to, you know, the 1930s, like the Green New Deal as, as times of like rapid change because they're so infrequent. But before we get too far down that rabbit hole, I've got to ask David Dole, Marjorie Green, can she win? I think she can win the nomination. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think it also depends on on competition. Um, I hadn't thought about until Sarah brought it up the the how conservatives would feel about, you know, a, a, a woman saying these things as opposed to, you know, Donald Trump saying and getting away with it. So I, I because you brought that up, I think, I think she would have a harder time. I think if, uh, you know, if DeSantis in Florida ran, he would have a better shot than, than Greenwood. Um, also assuming Trump doesn't run. I think if Trump runs, I, th I think he gets a nomination. I mean, based on, I mean, I know we can't put too much trust in polling, but if <laughs> right. polling does seem to lean conservative. So if the polling is to be believed, they still side with him for the most part. Um, but yeah, I think she has a shot. Absolutely. If she ran, I, I do have a question for Sarah, though. Why do they feel betrayed by Trump? What's what's the betrayal there? So like the weird thing is like they think that because he's like um, he stopped carrying the torch of the like election fraud, like the the big lie and all that stuff. Mm. And, and they're, they're like the anti-vax community has like this weird like overlap with these these people. And like they feel like because he suddenly just took the covid vaccine that like he's now betraying the values that he pretended embracing to embracing the deep state. Oh, wow. Yeah. He's part of the deep state and microchipped. And if you've ever watched your like dog get microchipped, did you know how fat that needle would have to be? to fit a freaking microchip in right. your body oh my god <laughs> yeah. But anyway, I would I digress. But like, so they feel betrayed by him because like they now it's like Mike Lindell, the pillow guy who's like handling all of this like election fraud stuff. He's kind of phased himself out and he's not really fighting as they see it. Um, mm. So they feel this level of like betrayal that's happened. And so there is like there is conservative infighting and there is conservative drama, just like there's leftist drama. We just aren't in the circles to see it. So I have to like mm. gaze through their Facebooks, unfortunately, to be able to see it. Let me ask you guys a question. Since uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene has said a lot of anti-Semitic things, Jewish space lasers famously, right. and uh, the, what was the recent thing she said about the vaccine and the Oh, Holocaust? she said it was basically comparable to the Holocaust. And then she had it. to come out and say, no, the Holocaust was actually worse or some, some stupid yeah. shit. Like, like she that. learned about the Holocaust for the first time ever. She went <laughs> yeah. to the museum. She yeah, went to the yeah. Holocaust museum. And I was so like, what I, what I wonder is, like, uh, <laughs> would... would um, Israel supporters uh, hop off of her altogether and say she's an anti-Semite? Um, I, I would say no, because the support for Israel in the United States is largely based off of evangelicals. Mm. So they they don't necessarily care about Israel insofar as like they, they're they're worried about Jewish people. They just like they view Israel as a means to an end. Mm. And the the end being like, you know, uh Jewish people have to overtake Israel and that could trigger like Jesus coming back. It's really like deep and it's it's very like hyper religious. But I don't necessarily think that her anti-Semitism, surprisingly and contradictory, seemingly so, <laughs> yeah. would, would would count her out because, you know, they 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 view that as well. We don't really care. I think there's a lot of even like anti-Semitism within the evangelical community that is very, you know, vocally pro-Israel. Mm. So I, I think that 
There's I'd some hypocrisy. No. There's, yeah, for oh, yeah. sure. There, there's they don't care hypocrisy. about hypocrisy at all. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Trump, oh Trump was anti-Semitic. I mean, he he's made right many statements that were anti-Semitic true. in speeches, yeah, and and so he, they they didn't care about that. That yeah, the hypocrisy they don't care at all about. Fair yeah, yeah. It's all, ultimately, like it all just comes back to like they have this like oh my gosh, I learned so much from like uh, being with someone that was so deep in the church. It's like it hurts my head some days. But like he, <laughs> like they're so they're obsessed with Israel insofar as its relationship, like Mike said to to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. But as far as like the as far as its relationship to like the Jewish people, like they don't see like um, they see that it's totally fine to be anti-Semitic, but protect the homeland of Jesus, mm -hmm. and like mm -hmm. that's how they look at it. So they they are it's it's just a mess and like they don't really care about it in the sense of the how the, the jewish people care about israel they care about it in the sense of how like oh jesus is homeland the second coming like the great hereafter is coming paradise is coming and it's just a total looney tunes theology but like i just don't a dude who was high on mushrooms wrote a book at like hundred true years yeah ago, and they're like <laughs> it's real and i'm like i should have written a book like two weeks ago most Holy of the shit. people who believe in this shit have never tried shrooms by the way so they, they, <laughs> oh, to them it is magical they need <laughs> shrooms yeah like if, if they did it, maybe they'd be like hey this is actually all that crazy i can <laughs> do it and then like having and i'm just gonna be honest i'm again like not sure how real i can be like having done them i'm like People believed, like, if people just did these, they'd turn around and look at Revelations and be like, oh, oh, <laughs> yeah. maybe not. Maybe dragons aren't going to fly through the sky in the dead of night. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, that, that if you watch, um, man, I'll have to reach out to you, Him, afterwards. There's a documentary I watched on American evangelicals that even, like, growing up evangelical in this community, there was so much that I wasn't aware of. Um, and it's it's mind blowing. I'll have to see if I can find yeah, it. But please. it's I love that because I grew up secular, so religion, religious too. fanatics, fanaticism is a very interesting dynamic so for weird. me to explore. Um, if yeah. it does, if you guys, I don't know if you take this. No offense to anyone who is religious or has faith. Like by all means, bless, have faith, whatever floats your boat. Um, the the sect with the sharpest decline of membership um, is actually evangelicalism now. So oh, wow. and it's, I saw that's because really they're being concern. silenced by the mainstream media. Oh, that's, okay? that's, that's <laughs> that. um, I saw this religiosity chart though, that showed like uh, the religiosity of all the different generations. And like, you've like boomers and then you've like Gen X right here. And then millennials are like down here and we drop off. And then Gen Z literally just goes, <laughs> And so, like, so Gen Z is over it, and like it's just it, I'm but, really interested to see what happens. Next. I, I think if I recall, all polling in general, like as people get older, they embrace their. It's like the, they're afraid of dying or something, and they get more religious. Like younger generations right. are always less religious, but somehow yeah. religion continues, right? Like it's always like if these this current young generation grows up, religion's over. But then they grow <laughs> up, and some of them become conservatives, and some of them become religious. And yeah, like uh, Nancy. I had a reminder: Nancy Pelosi used to be like considered the most progressive member of the House. She was like a mm -hmm. founding member of the Progressive Caucus. Like so, Queen. you know, <laughs> she just got close to death, and something changed. 